Before talking about Islam in Africa, I already talked about a little bit of this. That one, I don't know if you share this. Often when people talk about Islam in Africa, they have a much more positive view of it. Maybe up until recently uh, with the stuff going on in Mali and Algeria, no. But uh, prior to that, the general assumption was like, oh, this is a different kind of Islam, right? It's synchronistic, it's much more localized. And, and, and part of that has to do with the racist attitudes towards blacks, um, that there was this general assumption that Islam had a civilizing effect, a good civilizing effect. In the 19th century, people talked about it as though actually like Islam paving the way by you know, bringing education to um, uh, black West Africans and East Africans, paving the way for Christianity. Like it was a semi-civilized religion uh, that was paving the way for, uh, for Christianity. Um, and that has had a lot to do with the way in which people have generally talk about African Islam. Um, they put it in, the, in a separate, uh, separate category um, than the Islam of the Middle East or, uh, or um, uh, North, North Africa or, uh, or Central Asia. And I hope we don't do that. <laughs> that um, um, that you know, we, this is, we see this as part of a larger global phenomenon, which it actually was. The other thing I was going to say, when we're talking about Islam in Africa, I'm really talking about Islam in the, in the Sahel here, right? Um, the, which was non-Arabic speaking. And we're not talking about these other, not, so East Africa and um, West Africa. And it was predominantly shaped um, by trade. And what's really interesting, and contact with the rest of the Muslim majority. The Islam in this, in this area was shaped by trade. So in Arabic, actually, this region is called the Sahel, which is both the desert and the shore. <laughs> um, so it was, it was defined in terms, of, um, in terms of contact. A general way in which people talk about, the textbooks talk about history of Islam in Africa um, is by seeing the Islam in Africa having three phases, and here um, I'm relying on the work of David Robinson, um, who wrote a, what I think is a best sort of introductory book for thinking about religion, Islam in particular, in um, African history, uh, broadly understood in black Africa, more, uh, so South Africa and other places more generally. Um, the, and according to this, there were three phases. Um, the first phase was um, when Muslims were a minority, um, they had relations with the, they were, you know, they were either in trading communities themselves, because of course people couldn't just fly into places. It took a long time to get to a place and you had to rest and reload to be able to move on again. Um, so they created, you know, mosques, but they were pre predominantly quarantined in those areas. They practiced Islam among themselves. These were Arab traders or uh, later on um, uh, South Asian traders who came through the Indian Ocean to, to East Africa, but um, they mainly were quarantined in, in a minority community. Um, as they became more established, and since given that they, they were a source of wealth for the local elites, um, local elites began to uh, convert to Islam um, and adopted this. Uh, so we began to see a discord to Islam. And in the Ibn Battuta, Battuta reading that I gave you, you get a sense of this court Islam. Um, you, get a you get a sense of the presence of the, when they talk about the faqih, the jurist, and the khatab, the person who gives the imam, who gives the Friday sermons, being present in the, in the court ceremonies. Um, you, get, you get the sense that Islam was not the religion of the people, more generally, right? It, was a, it, was a, it had, a, it had a, a presence in the ruling communities much more. On those phases, is that possible? Just, I mean, transitional phases. Yeah, I'm losing track. Um, so it's it's um, the the they're used as phases, not as sort of periods, because depending on what region is, the assumption is that as Muslims came into newer contact, they went through the same thing. So it begins in the 12th century in the coasts and then goes inward. And the assumption is that the, according to this point of view, this classical point of view. Uh, this phase repeats itself as Muslims get into new regions as they go further inward. And the trade was done both through the desert, so caravans with, you know, coming in from through the desert and ships coming into the coasts. And then the idea was that it slowly, um, the 
local population also begins to convert to Islam and it becomes the majority, uh, majority uh, religion. Now, when you look at the Ibn Battuta readings, it's interesting to see, so he talks, he talks about also the praise singers, the, you know, that the Ibn Battuta talks about as in, the translation he has talks about as an interpreter. The treatment that he receives is very different from the treatment that the Muslims, the, the, the jurists and the khatib receive in the court. You know, he comes in with, he gets gifts and so on. Um, and uh, the khatib and the, and the faqih, the Muslim elites, are sort of just simply presences uh, in the court. Um, and that, I think, is also, is also very telling and something to keep in mind because the presence of Islam was in this, in this region uh, wasn't in the same way that older means of class distinction and the older means of older forms of hierarchies uh, existed. The, 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 the position of the Dugo, the praise singer, was a clan position that was existed within a certain, certain group, within a certain family. And for Muslims, it was very different. So when you look at Ibn, uh, Ibn Battuta, Ibn Battuta is able to receive respect in all these regions that he travels to simply because of the knowledge of Islam that he has. That that knowledge in itself was a currency, not a bloodline, not a, uh, not a uh, uh, you know, um, sort of military palace or anything, anything of that sort. Um, that it's amazing that he's able to travel throughout the world in this region through Muslim societies and trade on the fact that he's a, he's a jurist, he's a faqih. To the point that in that reading that I gave you, he is actually disappointed with what the, <laughs> what the king brings him and goes and when he has a chance, asks the king and he says, so you know, I'm traveling a lot and meeting some other kings. And when they ask me how hospitable you were and how generous your kingdom was, what should I tell them given that you just gave me dinner as my, as my going away gift or as my gift? And the ruler immediately receives the message and gives him a house and gives him a lot more money and gold so that he could, he could go on. Um, right? So um, Islam introduced another means of social, uh, developing social hierarchies, which could help explain why it slowly becomes a majority uh, uh, <coughs> religion. Now, I'd like us to think a little bit, or I'd like to argue that we ought to think about um, the presence of Islam in Africa a bit differently. And throughout this thing, I have Africa in quotes because I'm not talking about all of Africa, right? We're talking about that, that sub-Saharan region. And I'd like to argue that the model that we saw goes back to what I talked about yesterday that sees Islam as this homogenizing thing that comes in, that's packaged, that's uh, you know, monolithic, that you could see its boundaries clearly and you could identify it when you see it clearly because it's in the pillars, it's in certain practices um, you know, uh, that, that Muslims throughout the world have. And uh, it slowly washes away everything else and, and, and enforces itself on everybody else. And that, that's not how reality works. So in reality, the process of Islamization and Africanization, just as we saw in the Sons of Independence, that short reading I gave you, go hand in hand. Um, that both were occurring at the, at the same time. And in the Bin Batuta readings, you could see this too, that you know, he talks about the local population saying, we have kept some old, old practices. Um, and uh, you know, he talks about the nudity that he found uh, reprehensible, right? that, uh, that ha had been maintained. Uh, so we ought to, when we think about uh, and Islam in Africa, we ought to be looking for both things, how it is that local practices change and how it is that Islam is interpreted in relationship to um, the, the local practices. And you could see that also in the juristical readings I gave you, the fatwas, the opinions that I gave you, where you could see that uh, rulers trying to negotiate these things and trying to say, well, they, have, they say they're Muslim, but they have also these houses of worship where they have idols. What do I do with these? You know, how do I consider them? Do I free them? Do I not, how, do I, how do I take these things into consideration? We ought to see both of those things in relationship together. So we ought to see Islamization and Africanization as two sides of the same coin. Um, to get back to the issue of, um, of trade, um, for even though most, you know, um, you, well, people don't do this today, but people always think uh, Islam is the religion of the sword. It was spread by the sword. The truth of the matter is that trade and uh, Sufis, but 
trade more importantly, did a lot more to spread Islam throughout the, uh, throughout the world because Islamic law provided very sophisticated legal means by which people could trade uh, reliably, uh, by which people could lend each other money, uh, allowing things like checks to be written uh, you know, so that people could be able to negotiate and tra uh, trade very, very well. Um, and also, as people like Marshall Hodgson have talked about, um, it was a religion that was transportable. Right? It wasn't tied to a temple. It wasn't tied to a region. It wasn't tied to a particular uh, racial or ethnic identity. Um, and so it was, it was, uh, it was easily um, uh, uh, transportable and then thus a good religion for a mercantile class or a, or a trading class. And um, again, when you think of that region that I showed you that's talking about as the Sahel, this was, you know, this was, there were two gateways to it. The one was a, uh, the desert gateway by which trade was done, and one was the Indian Ocean gateway that by which trade was done, and those are the ways by which Islam came into the, into the region.